Kia ora everybody, what's up? It is Rebet. welcome to Rebet Live. Ah, oh, another day, another weapon, another world-class New Zealander. Ladies and gentlemen, Elizabeth Irons, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. Thanks for is having how me. Is, is that how people like to introduce you? Elizabeth Irons, world-class <laughs> New Zealander. <laughs> no, not normally. <laughs> um, how about this, Sea of Science um, Exchange? And then I've just, I got a, I like to publicly fl flex f on your behalf. Um, <laughs> Uh, Irons was mentioned as one of the 50 women who are changing the world and Irons was one of the six female entrepreneurs to receive the Glamour Master Award from Glamour Magazine. Well done. <laughs> Thanks. How cool. Um, so we, you're Silicon Valley Mafia, where you're at, what's going on? Well, I am in Palo Alto doing the shelter in place. Um, so for us, our company Science Exchange is fully remote, um, not normally, we'd normally be in the office, but definitely very easy for us to go remote. So we're all just working from home and trying to help our clients with their research and development still, which a lot of it is related to COVID-19. So it's been kind of interesting. Interesting or batshit crazy? <laughs> yeah, definitely pretty crazy. I think I, um, you know, we were just chatting before we started the live feed, but I think for both of us, I if I had have known it was going to end up going on this long i probably would have made some different decisions about where to shelter in place like it might have been one of the few opportunities to actually go back to new zealand and spend you know a month or two there instead of here which would have been nice but um yeah trying to make the best of it here yeah it's it's probably just never been a time where you thought oh wait a second i might not be able to get home you know, and then for someone like, oh, wait a second, like think of any, how many, you know, couples and families and relationships and, you know, long distance Tinder dates and whatever else <laughs> just being like logistically <laughs> shut down. Be like, what the fuck? I yeah, know, that, gnarly, piece is, that piece is really scary. I think, um, you know, for me, most of my family is in New Zealand and Australia and to kind of see both of those countries, you know, really literally close the borders. Um, and although I'm a citizen, you know, and we could go back and go in quarantine for 14 days. It just feels like that, um, that feels very far away. Like if something happened to one of them, you know, you literally couldn't get there um, to help them. Mm. That feels really like, that's the first time I've ever felt like that. It's it's like a you know, long, long game logistics that you start to genuinely think about, you know, like, you know, physically, what does in many ways it's it's actually making many people think more macro with life right like you know what will this look like and you know say with the events or music or business you know people are thinking now in horizons of six months 12 months 18 months and if you look at cash flow for their businesses that have been mostly transactional in communities or whatever they're day to day and it must just be a weird headspace eh like to to be all of a sudden thrust into such long term strategic thinking for businesses right that yeah, plus logistics and yeah, geez. Yeah, it's a lot when you think of it like that, eh? <laughs> well, I think the and particularly with with those type of businesses with such a change in um in their revenue streams and their strategy and like being unsure of what the path forward is, I think would be very challenging. Um that's something I you know, I'm really grateful that for us we are in an industry where, you know, R and D continues and is relatively sheltered from you know, those kind of macroeconomic changes. It's not like the travel industry or anything like that. But, um, you know, of course, it impacts everybody in the way that they're doing their business. So maybe rewind back, uh, back for a bit. So, you know, you grew up in, um, was it born in Australia, grew up in Hawke's Bay, but then lived in America. Is that right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. Yeah. So what from, obviously, you know, do you, where does your soul sit? It's definitely New Zealand for sure. So, I mean, I was born in Australia, but I only lived there till I was two years old. So, oh, I that always that doesn't count. That doesn't. It count. doesn't count, right? Yeah. Like you can't even remember <laughs> it. I have like no memory of of being born there. And I actually, when I go back to Australia, you know, on vacation, I feel almost no connection to that country. Like it's it's actually very interesting how different Australia is from New Zealand. And I think you know, particularly in America, Americans don't understand that unless you sort of explain well think how different canada is from from the us um and so i think you know whenever i go ho home to 
New Zealand, it feels very much more like home than mm. if I go and visit, you know, somebody in Australia where I'm like, this is not my home. <laughs> this doesn't feel like it. Is is that some Hawke's Bay pen and wire behind you, left left shoulder? What is that? Oh, um, <laughs> actually, yeah. Oh, it's a, actually it's some sure. fancy Silicon Valley shit. You, you, you <laughs> it probably actually is local <laughs> local wines. Although I love, um, I do love New Zealand wines as well. But we are super lucky here. I think Silicon Valley actually reminds me a lot of Hawke's Bay, um, and does make me feel you know, more at home than any of the other places that I've spent time. I lived in London to do my PhD in Miami, um, where I was an assistant professor before I started Science Exchange. And I never, never saw either of those places really as, as home. Um, and Palo Alto feels, you know, like it's going to be my home for the near future. Although, like I said, I, I guess ultimately I feel like New Zealand is, is where my heart is at. So let's get into some, some science stuff. Now, I, I, I failed high science. school, some science stuff. I failed high school, not the smartest tool in the shed, but I am very intrigued around um, the dynamics of how information from those that know versus the information of those that do not know um, has has caused lots of issues. So if, uh, I was talking with um, Michelle Dickinson in New Zealand about, you know, I just wish that in times like this, scientists and those with educational nows would have the same platforms publicly and seem as the same, you know, um, the depth of influence as influences or other media personalities, whatever. And I just kind of got, I got a bit bummed that there weren't more heroes in science, you know, that were the 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 go tos instead of just you know old mate on the radio that doesn't know shit actually about it because he's not <laughs> actually in it. From as someone who knows what's up, do you get frustrated that? those that actually really know don't have the proper platforms for voice louder than those that don't like educate does that make sense yeah i definitely think that makes sense i think with science in particular is it's it's a challenge because a lot of scientists are in some ways very focused on their own science rather than on communicating out you know to the general public general public and so um, I think in America, it's been interesting to see the platform that Dr. Fauci's had and how he's been, you know, able to sort of be the voice of reason um, and have a scientific, you know, take, you know, in contrast to Trump. But then at the same time, that's caused, you know, a lot of people to feel, you know, really angry at him and feel like he's sort of threatening Trump, which is crazy. So I... I guess for me, being a scientist, you know, this whole pandemic, the poor quality of the data has been probably the thing that's been most frustrating. Because if yeah, you think about it, like it's almost like every there. single every single thing has been <laughs> kind of bad in the sense that we don't have good data on how many people are infected. Even our assays that we were using to test people were, you know, really bad, and so even we were getting like the basics wrong right from the start of how many people are infected, are our tests really working well? Um, you know, can we really do this at scale to track them? And then, you know, when you start to have even just basic things that you can't report on, like you can't accurately report on cases, then you have no idea of the case fatality rate. You don't really have any way to know like how lethal is, the infection, how infectious is the infection? <laughs> so it's like all these yeah. models. Like if you think about the model that was originally deployed um, in the United States, you know, it, even in the in the best case scenario, they were project they were projecting hundreds of thousands of deaths, and in the worst case, millions of deaths. And that's clearly you know not going to come to pass as we get you know more and more information, and as the shelter in place has really helped to slow that spread. But it does. Um, it does kind of, you know, raise all of these questions about could we have used this time that we were sheltering in place better to get better quality data? And I think we've kind of, you know, we acted slow at the start and then we had poor quality tests and then we haven't deployed those tests even while we had the opportunity. So it's, it's, I've seen people in Silicon Valley who always want to just kind of do stuff, right? Like Silicon Valley people always want to find a way to so change made, the world, yeah. right? And they are, they're sort of like, my god is nobody going to do anything let's um let's kind of get our own tests and you know start testing people um it's been kind of crazy to sort of be on the sidelines of that 
Yeah, the intersection of, you know, politics, science, media, community and commerce is it's like a really fun funky intersection when you throw all those in the same mix. Yeah, you can't, the going back to the, the data piece, when there's in a simplest form, when there's not enough data, you don't get enough um, accuracy to start with. So whatever comes come out of it isn't going to be aligned with what probably is the truth, right? So you're probably stuffed from the get go because you didn't have the rest of data. <laughs> yeah, I actually at the start, you know, people were sending me, you know, of course, like being the only scientist in my family. So my family always asked me all these weird medical <laughs> questions, you know, all the time, even though I'm not a medical doctor. But um, so they were asking me, you know, well, how should we sort of think about this? And look at these, you know, look at these cases and like, it seems like the cases are going down or they're plateauing, but like when you actually dug into it, it was like the testing capacity was reached. And so you weren't necessarily picking up all of the cases. And so I started to revert to this kind of, well, the only data that I'm sort of trusting is deaths because at least, you know, the death data is probably like somewhat accurate, but then it turned out that even the death rate data wasn't accurate because mm. there was a lot of people dying you know, at home and it wasn't being recorded. So even the death data was actually like fairly unreliable. And so I got to the point where I just was like, I don't really know what data source is really useful to kind of track how the pandemic is, is going and which places, you know, are really implementing the best possible measures. Because I think, you know, all those pieces we talked about in terms of data, like the thing that people kind of aren't talking about very much as well is, if you take the emotions out of the shelter in place and what comes next, like people are very emotional about it. Like they kind of react either if you don't agree with shelter in place, then you're kind of a crazy person. Or if you, or if you want to open everything back up, then you're kind of a crazy person. Like there's, there, there's a lot of emotions about it. Whereas I sort of look at it like, you know, I think we did the right thing to shelter in place because it was the best thing that, that there was available, but nobody has tested scientifically like what's actually needed to prevent that spread. So so staying inside your house for the indefinite future is not practical, right? Like we can't just stay inside our house for the next year. But um, but you start to see like Sweden and other countries that have started to test different, you know, different mechanisms, right? Like they didn't go to a lockdown. They just kept their restaurants open, kept, you know, a lot of things open, but tried to encourage people to socially distance, you know, wear masks in public. And so I think trying to look at, you know, some of the statistics around, you know, infection rates and deaths as people try different experiments and see what's really required would be, you know, a good, good thing to kind of share more widely. Yeah. Back to the point that was with around like the strategy of how governments have reacted to a pandemic in a weird way that they feels like they've had rule books, but they've simultaneously made up rules as they've gone along. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah. you're kind of like, so what rules are we playing? Is this chess or checkers? Like, what is this shit? Yeah. Um, if you were to re, if you knew that Corona would hit America in January of this year, how would you restructure the, the thinking around your approach from a government level? to do it better so data came the right data came first faster how would you sprinkle the iron's fairy dust over this shit what would you do <laughs> yeah i think the first thing that you know clearly was like the biggest problem was the lack of accurate testing so um that's just a you know a kind of unimaginable like floor that happened like i don't think anybody could have predicted that the cdc would literally you know, be unable to make a very basic qPCR test and distribute what, that. What does that mean? QP, is it, what's that? It's the it's the quantitative RT PCR. So it's used to measure RNA. So it measures whether or not you're infected with the virus. The so that's that, that. The nose it's, one. You can do it through a nose swab. Yep. So that's the that's the main um, type of test that people right. use to determine whether you have an active infection, and then. You know, following on from that, you can develop serological tests, which are the antibody tests, which determine, you know, whether you've been previously infected, but they often can miss if you have an active infection because you only develop antibodies over several weeks after you're infected. So it's your adaptive immune response. Um, and so I think the CDC's inability to develop, you know, a qPCR assay that worked 
Um, and then the fact that the government, I think, didn't react in the United States in the way that people would have anticipated. So they actually, um, you know, released this emergency, you know, enactment. And that actually prevented people from being able to develop their own tests. So ironically, the emergency situation made it more difficult to actually access tests that worked because you then had to use this test that was developed by the CDC that did not work. So they slowed testing down by a really long time because of that mistake. And I don't think no one could have predicted that, that that would happen. And so that's probably the one thing that, you know, they missed a huge window on was, can we get on top of this by testing people as soon as we sort of became aware that the infection was starting to you know, enter the United States. And and from their side, I'm imagining that the thought process behind it is uh, we don't want a bunch of Wild West monkeys doing a whole bunch of random testing to not get the right data. Let's use ours because ours was right. And then they, so they almost block everyone, every other player to do it, put theirs out, don't have the scale to be able to do it. And then the data comes back and then it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah something like that. That is so, gnarly. Okay, so so, so the yeah. first piece that was wrong would be so so if you were to do the sprinkle dust, it would be um, Get scaled out testing. mass <laughs> testing, yeah, and then which would testing. give you the the data, right? Yeah. And then what? What would the next? Um, I think the next the next phase is really, you know, having um, the serological tests that let you determine who's been previously infected, and that's useful not just for identifying people who like as they talk about could be safe to go back into the workplace because they've already been infected. I think it's actually more important because you can start to look at, um, you know, in cities that have had, you know, widespread exposure like New York City, what percentage of New York City actually has already been exposed and infected. Um, And it may be very high. So some of the data from places like in Italy and other areas where there was, you know, the sort of epicenters of those outbreaks, they were seeing, you know, in the 30 to 40 percent um, range of people who were infected Jeez. previously, which is super. But that actually is very. Um, you, you say like, "Geez, like that seems bad," but actually, I, seems I think bad. it seems bad. But when you think about it, actually, it's really reassuring because the more people who had the infection already, and it actually, you know, the more people who were infected versus died, you start to see that the mortality uh, rate of the virus is a lot lower than what it looks like because you get this weird um, influence of if you only know cases that are very serious yep. because those people go to hospital, then they, by definition, you've selected for you know population that's already very sick. And then you think that the virus is much worse in terms of mortality than it actually is. So the first one would be the sprinkles to do mass testing, right? The second one would be to test those that potentially did have it, which would give a truer number of the full data set to give an actual prior lower percentage of the mortality rate as well. And that gives you, yeah, that just lets you see yeah. like better data so that you can then model like what is working, what's not working, how strict should we be, what people are at risk, what people are not at risk. Like all of those things are really important for having a strategy about um, how can you start to sort of get back to some level of normalcy it's going to not be you know immediately back to the way it was but you know you have to have some kind of intermediate um steps of opening things back up like the schools and and things that just are i feel like for parents i don't know how parents are (laughs) i'm not a parent but i don't know how parents can imagine a world where their schools might be closed for the rest of the year and then they still have to work that seems crazy <laughs> i would be gonna, like what yeah do you think it's hitting a it's gonna hit a point i'm not saying you know right or rebellion to go back into freedom where you know you said you said at the start with you know you can't just stay in your house for a year what's that tipping point gonna be let's say if it you know some some spots are already you know letting people go to the beach or do this or do that and if a second wave comes how's that te- do you think that tension is going to be between you know stay in place reopenings clearly no alignment nationally for in America of what should or shouldn't be done. And then another wave hits on top of, you know, kids at home with parents for, for schooling. Like <laughs> yeah. surely this, it's actually got the makings of a, a, a moment, which may not be very good. <laughs> yeah. I think um, that's going to be the way it is. Like, I think there's no doubt that as things open up and people experiment on, um, can we open schools? Can we open restaurants? 
you know, what can we open um, that you will see a reemergence of um, cases. So you'll start to see that, you know, the shelter in place was suppressed them. And then as you open things up, there'll be, you know, more infections and then you'll have to close some things down again. It will definitely be like a an up and down and people will just have to sort of be aware that that's the way it is going to be. Um, I do think that it's really important that people have that conversation around, you know, we can't just stay inside, you know, for the next year because I kind of feel like New Zealand has done a good job on this of communicating clearly about when things will happen, right? Like I feel like they've said, you know, this is currently at level four and then next Monday we'll go to level three and this is what it will mean. And the US, it's like, no one tells you anything. It's like, okay, we don't know when it's going to be whatever, but also it's way less rules. So like, I don't know for you, but you know, certainly here in Palo Alto, I go out running every morning and there's a lot of people outside doing stuff. Like there's no, there's no police going around telling you not to do stuff which I'm actually glad of because I think that would cause an America like that would just not, that would not go down. Like people would not be okay with that. Um, So I just, yeah, I kind of think that having clear guidelines, if you just don't tell anybody, like it's just going to stay like this for the indefinite future, people are just going to be like, okay, well then this is stupid. I'm going to start like hanging out with my friends and have dinner with other people and they'll start to, to just make up their own kind of path. Yeah, it's. I think the interesting point you said there. You know, you can't if cops were going around to 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 say, hey, you can't do this or that. And it's like, no, stuff you. This is my right in America, and, and it, that tension <laughs> comes up. There's already been like people saying, you know, I've got a right not to wear a mask and this and that. I know. And then, yeah. Ironically enough, if you think about where New Zealand is at versus America, um, as a collective unified approach and togetherness to approach an issue, culturally and community wise, commercially it's actually going to be better for everyone and safer with less deaths and more opportunity to get back into business sooner, everything by actually doing it. But because of the way that, you know, the, the way that you even said that is because you just know how Americans are to say stuff that we're not going to go do it. <laughs> do it. No. Instantly that, that shows it's going to be worse commercially, worse yeah. for health, worse for community and worse for, worse for the whole thing. So it actually goes to show the type of, people that exist in the country changes the expectations of what is normal but then also in the real world it's actually going to turn out to be a better thing for for those that can get on the same page right yeah i think it's it's you know i think the thing that makes it so hard to compare is like new zealand is such a small country and is you know as an island so they can literally feel the border and and they also are a very agricultural country, so they can produce enough food that they're not kind of thinking, okay, how are we going to get enough food and stuff? So I think they're in a very good position versus America is just such a huge hmm. country to rely on. It's like kind of unimaginable how, you know, you know this yourself, but like when you travel across America, the difference in terms of people in Palo Alto or the Bay Area versus people in the middle of America or the south of America is just very, very stark. And so I think trying to kind of call it like everyone's going to react in a certain way in America is is very difficult. You can't really apply rules across Mm. the whole country. But, um, you know, I think with New Zealand, the thing that I've sort of thought about, which I'm sure they're thinking a lot about, but it's so dependent on tourism that, um, you know, if their strategy is just close the border until there's a vaccine, I don't know how it comes out of that because that would be devastating to the economy. Yeah. The, I mean, a, a buddy of mine in the tourism space, you know, as a revenue lost 97% uh, yep. over, overnight yep. and uh, had to let go of basically 95% of the staff. And we're talking hundreds, yeah. um, you know, entire, entire ecosystems like Queenstown, you know, they've got some. Yeah. That to, to must be, be crazy. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So there's tourism's got a, a, a a lot of work and, and and the approach seems to be you know back your local local regional national and then international but even at that you know the average kiwi um, wouldn't be pro spending you know 300 bucks to go skydiving or, or or 250 all day every day going bungee jumping or whatever so there's going to be some um a, a bunch of those sort of chats i was gonna i was gonna ask you what do you think has been the biggest 
misconception about COVID in the public domain that you've thought about that just pisses you off that everyone in the mainstream and you're just like, guys, you're flipping Muppets. What are you doing? What's been the thing that's just got you frustrated or misconception about COVID? Mm, I mean, probably a lot of things. I think, um, like I mentioned, is the kind of poor quality of the data. So like people assuming that the sort of epidemiological models are correct when they're based on, you know, very poor quality data. Some of the things that people talk about around, um, you know, things like, you know, sort of relying on waiting for a vaccine to come out. Like I think the, re the chance of a vaccine being developed and widely available like this year is basically like none. Like I don't think that it's possible. So there's some things like that that I'm just like, we need to, kind of be more realistic about yeah. what the things, the interventions that will be available will be. So I really like the um, idea of using the convalesced plasma. So again, using kind of antibodies from people who have already been exposed. And there's some evidence that, you know, those could potentially be effective um, also as a prophylactic. So using them to protect people from being infected, particularly like frontline health workers. Um, all of the data that is being generated around, um, you know, what drugs like therapeutics might be effective. So being able to use um, like IL-6 inhibitors to prevent cytokine storm, which is the major cause of death for patients that get, you know, very, very sick and are in, in um, intensive care. Um, these things like, I think, trying to get that kind of approach and understand how to treat people who get sick like that's probably the most likely way that we're going to you know be able to manage if we can treat people better so that they're more likely to live and they're not in intensive care so the hospitals don't get overwhelmed that's kind of the reality is like I don't think kind of thinking there's going to be some magical vaccine this year that's going to protect everyone is really realistic so that's what Gates was saying. He reckons it's at least 18 months for, the, for that. I think so. By the time you have, yeah, all of the manufacturing. And, um, you know, not to be pessimistic, but there's a lot of infectious diseases that we have not successfully developed vaccines against. So, like, we're also kind of hoping that we are successful at developing a vaccine and that, you know, that works kind of the first try and then we go into manufacturing. But science is not like that. It takes you know, a lot of work and a lot of understanding and years of research a lot of the time to get something that works. And so that worries me a little bit that if you don't kind of prepare other mechanisms to sort of move forward, that, you know, we'll end up in that position. It may be that, you know, the vaccines that people are testing don't work and then what? So that's an area that <laughs> kind of from a pessimistic side worries me a little bit. Mate, the, the way you're sounding, everyone's going to start swimming to New Zealand. Jeez. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about if New Zealand wanted to open up its borders, like why they couldn't do that kind of point of care diagnostics. Like if they could actually deploy, you know, some of the rapid diagnostic testing, you could actually potentially screen, you know, everyone that was entering and then you would know you know, these people can't come in because they're infected. So again, to get to like the testing sort of being the, the key piece, it really does underlie all of the strategies. Um, so getting the testing working well would, would be the biggest thing you could do to make a difference. Yeah, the speed of, if we go right to the nuts and bolts of it, if you could get a, you know, 10 minute fast turnaround mass produced test on the spot, mm -hmm. you could instantly go through airport, customs, yep. check in, you're safe, I don't know, flipping green wristband, flipping X marks a spot on your forehead or some <laughs> shit, safe, you're flipping away laughing. Because then you'd get on the plane, you're just like, ah, oh, we're all safe, giddy up, let's go. Especially when it's like yeah. invisible, right? Because you don't know. And that's one yeah. of the things I'm, I'm, I've am I'm, been thinking about of after this rolls and you, you want to hug those you love. Mm -hmm. What if you've got it? You don't want to kill them. So how I know, you, I know. <laughs> like, oh, because right now, like you, you can, you can guarantee and it's pretty, it's pretty sad, but when people start either breaking the bubbles or doing this or that, or randomly they get something in there, they could be bringing that in. And actually there's going to be, you know, there's going to be losses, unfortunately, in situations through family that, that wanted to do it out of love, you know, and the, 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 the heartbreak of, of that just is, is, is horrible to think about, you know, like imagine being, 
you know, some teenager, you go out to, you know, you sneak out with your mates, have a few drinks, come back. And the next thing you know, you pass on to your grandma and she dies and everyone knows it was you. And then you've, you know, like it's going to stuff people up, you know? And actually, I mean, that, that is like the most, you know, they basically studied how um, people were getting infected. And so the most um, common, you know, route of infection was acquiring the infection from um, close contact at home. So essentially from other family members that was, you know, I think, again, when you sort of see what are the common misperceptions, and again, there's not like a huge amount of data on this, but I think people's reactions around, you know, when you're out jogging and somebody comes within six feet of you, like, I'm kind of like, I actually am pretty skeptical that that's like a huge risk versus being in close proximity with somebody who is actively sick in your household um, is really, I think, where most of the infections are coming from. Yeah. What do you think what do you think the most important thing people should know about now? Like if you're a scientist, you understand all the shit people are locked in their houses, they're locked in place, they're trying to figure out what's next. What's the most health or science based most important thing you think people should know? Um <laughs> I think for people who are at home, you know, I think one of the challenging things now is like how do you sort of stay healthy and you know in terms of healthy also like mentally healthy because I think one of the areas that people are starting to talk about but will become more and more of a problem as you know the economy collapses and people are you know sheltering in place for long periods of time and the stress of that is really the impact to you know your mental health as well as you know being able to get out and exercise and keep healthy and and actually those things also you know, it's not just the pandemic that's the threat. It's also the threat of, you know, all of the other diseases that you could get and like just your general, you know, health and well-being. And I think people need to develop, you know, mechanisms while they're living in this uncertainty to try to keep healthy both um, through like physical exercise, but also, you know, trying to sort of maintain like not, you know, extremely elevated stress levels. Yeah, the the mental pressure of it's it's so tough because when it's all in one right like if you're in business and you haven't had to have strategic thinking long game like this before that's a pressure if you've if you've constantly moved around and been doing stuff and you get locked in a confined space that's a pressure if you've had time with your spouse or wifey and and partner and then that's a pressure then you've got kids and that's a pressure and so just all of that combined on top i mean in new zealand obviously you know there's a very high level of um, of suicide and mental health the good the, the good part of it is at least there's um there's a lot of talkability and awareness and acceptance around the issue of it to at least talk about it i'd rather be having a mental health conversation in 2020 than 2010 in new zealand um, yeah and so at least i mean we've got some pretty solid heroes that have stepped up to the plate you know the john Kerwins and mike kings the craig hudson's from zeros just good flipping humans that are that are, that are bringing it out and they're creating i kind of call them that they're creating these trojan horses as a vehicle for you for others to be able to talk about and to get into and what i've been interested in or thinking about is how how you could create micro vehicles for communities or friends to have safe spaces remotely like what does that look like and i was you know as i was thinking is it like a um I had a note on my calendar. I was going to do a little thing. Is it like a business banter WhatsApp group of like a six pack of six friends that are in business that that they get used as like a kind of like a a, a group. I don't know if it's therapy mm-hmm. slash ideas slash there's something. I think there's a there's a, a Trojan horse. I guess I'm trying to say for scaling out, um, you know, safe spaces virtually. That I yeah, think, that's interesting. You know, you know that's like, actually very interesting because I think people are you know, that kind of, particularly if you're, like for me, I think and for all people, like you have, you know, a lot of responsibility, right? Like, so for me, I feel this like intense stress around the responsibility of, you know, navigating the changing business environment while, you know, making sure that all of my staff feel supported and that they're safe, right? Like that they're not going to you know, lose their job. Um, and so you're trying to kind of navigate all of those those things so that they can still, you know, <laughs> be well and safe, but also still do their job. So mm. it's, um, I think like having the ability to talk with other peers about how they're handling that is 
um, could be actually like incredibly valuable because we were part of Y Combinator and that that sort of experience of having a, a batch of like people who were founding companies at the same time, which is, you know, when you, when, as you know, when you found a company, very, very stressful, the initial period. Um, and that initial period, having people who you could talk to honestly about, Hey, I kind of think I suck and like my company sucks. And can you, <laughs> can you like check if I suck or is it, yeah. am I just being too hard on myself? And so that kind of piece of, of peers that can kind of, you know, help you. Like I think right now, um, while I'm part of, you know, a bunch of investor CEO forums, they're relatively in, impersonal in the sense that I could ask them, hey, um, you know, with your employees, are you doing like all hands every day or are you doing, you know, virtual all hands once a week or like how are you handling like your staff? But, um, but I don't because I don't really know them. Because also the rules, there's no rules to it of what the expectations are. I think if you could... You know, we just got on this idea tangent, but I think it's a thing because there's in the in old world, I'm calling it like, you know, pre COVID PC and then after COVID AC. So in PC <laughs> you'd have like one to one therapy to talk about feelings, yep. stresses, whatever. And it was uh known, kind of accepted, but not fully in for, for the masses, right? Like as it was a minority that would either be self aware enough to go or those that had issues. And then you've now got you know brands and platforms so that's one to one and then you've now got brands and platforms which are to the millions i'm like well one of them is too much of a um uh uh i don't, I don't even know if it's a financial thing but it maybe feels too help helpless maybe for in some mm -hmm. for a lot of people some of them feels too aspirational but no practical and tactical shit and i'm kind of like what's that like many you know like safe squad who's in your safe squad that you can talk about all that other shit right like how does how do you create lots of bubbles of those create a brand of it and then you're like cool who's in your safe squad and then you set the framework of like it's a safe place to talk about feelings emotions stresses questions whatever but within within circles and i think if, as soon as you set ground rules then I, the like i've got a couple of those i've got a, a, a bigger group i've got a kind of a smaller group but i'm thinking outside of me it, there's a million people right now who are at home just they need they just got this weight on them. So these are just some of the things I've been thinking about. But maybe, you know, that idea of maybe the safe squad, there's probably some legs into that. So my brain was just going on a tangent. But I, but <laughs> no, I think it's, it's great. But great. I think it's important, right? Because then th these things are going to, like, in from May 11th, when, you know, they make the call to potentially go down, it's like, cool, you're still going to be kind of locked and some essential stuff. But that ne the then what, I guess, is what I'm concerned about, exactly to your point, Elizabeth, about the mental health thing. I think it's, it's yeah, kind of a thing. Yeah, the then what. Yeah, they're trying to navigate okay what's sort of next and um and i think when it first happened you know people were very obviously like very reactionary so even for us with our clients a lot of them you know they were basically like okay we're going to shut down research and just focus on our manufacturing because manufacturing is essential and research you know can kind of get put on hold and i think they were imagining a world where you were just sort of in this situation for a couple of weeks even though you know, they're scientists as well. So they sort of know probably that's not going to be the case. But now they're having to kind of emerge from that and rethink about, okay, that was our initial kind of, you know, emergency sort of reaction. How do we start to like actually imagine a world like we talked about where there's, you know, ups and downs of reemergence of cases over the foreseeable future? okay, like what, how can we start to open back up, you know, some of these more strategic, longer term things, like the next phase of research projects that, that mm -hmm. will need to be conducted. So people starting to be a bit more midterm and long term in their planning for their businesses. I don't know how businesses that are you know, sort of in the travel space or restaurant space or those spaces are kind of navigating that because it's so uncertain mm -hmm. for them versus, um, Versus a business like ours where it's impacted, but in a different way. Yeah, you're pretty smart there, Elizabeth. I can see why you got the medals. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, Edward Welsh says, Elizabeth, what do you think the future of domestic travel looks like here in the US? How safe will travel really be in the next six to 12 months? Oh, I'll answer that one, bro. It's going to be shit. What do you think about that? <laughs> I actually was looking at, uh, funnily enough, I was actually looking at flights. I used to spend half of my time traveling. 
So it's a huge change for me personally. Um, I would spend half my time either in Boston or New York, where a lot of our clients are based, and half my time here in the Bay Area. So um, my life was like changed completely by the the shelter in place. And so I was actually looking at flights the other day. I was like, oh, I, w- I might look at flights for May because I might go back out and to Boston. Some of my staff are based out there, and um, and I saw they're so cheap. <laughs> It's crazy how it's crazy how inexpensive flights are because they're just empty. But um, I think realistically for domestic travel, you know, airplanes, if you're sitting, you know, side by side with a person that is a carrier, that's definitely a risk, right? Like like what we talked about, that that, that type of like sitting next to somebody who was potentially a carrier of um you know of the of SARS CoV two, then they would be next to you for, you know, five or six hours and you would have a high chance of of catching the infection from them. So I don't know. I think the US is a long way from having that point of care testing where they could just screen everybody that came into the airport. Um so I actually have a lot of concerns about kind of the domestic travel situation, like how long it would take to get back to a world where we can just fly to New York for the weekend. I don't know. That seems like that's going to be a while away. Well, I think the same thinking would have to be in place as, as if you were thinking about from New Zealand borders of a fast test to prove that you are safe, some type yep. of marking to know that you are, and yeah. then you can giddy up and go. Because the reality is if you're taking a seven-hour flight, you're just as, as much risk as if you're taking a 13-hour flight, right? You're in there, old mate next to you is flipping, barking away, and you're stuffed, and the next thing you know, you've got this <laughs> shit, and you're like, fuck, and then you take it to your family. So, you know, it's, it's you know, like at the, at the moment, we were getting delivery groceries delivered to the house, and then, you know, there's a table, and, you know, wiping the crew, like, wipe down and shit. But what's interesting about that is you're looking at items and things that you touch, and you're like, well, where's that been? Who's touched that? You don't know. Yeah. You, you get, your brain starts getting crazy. And how crazy would it be if you, they, they open up too early, someone comes flying along, and it's not that you don't love them or trust them, it's that you don't know who they've been around, and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, 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 you know? That's going to be that's going to be interesting dynamics when it clicks back off. To what do you think those... about, you know, you saying that, like, that's one of the things I've really noticed, which I actually, you know, concerns me probably the most is that sort of mental model of people as a threat. So, like, I think yeah. of Palo Alto, right? So, like, Palo yeah. Alto is, like, so safe. It's, like, the safest bubble, weird place, you know, very, very safe. I've never, ever felt unsafe. And, like, like now when I'm out running or, you know, outside my house, people are so unfriendly. It's crazy. Like, it's like everyone is so suspicious of each other. Like get on your side of the road. Like there's just this very different unneighborly sort of reaction because people are afraid, like they're very afraid. And, um, that kind of worries me like in some ways more than the threat of actually getting infected with the virus. I think people are are changing their whole way that they think about their neighbors, the way they think about other people, and it's very hostile. And I think that's that's quite quite scary, actually. Yeah, so two two parts on that. One is it's very clear that the energy of the average Joe in America is different to the energy of the average Kiwi. Like New, New Zealanders, from all the content and everything I've seen, it is very much a unified approach of care for others. Mm-hmm. A, 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 New Zealand is we, America is me. <laughs> That's an interesting way to think about it. But like honey, like you can see the the vibe, the unit, like it's just the amount of you know support and pop ups and help and everything that's been coming towards New Zealanders within New Zealand. The energy has been so much different compared to stuff that I've seen in um, uh, America and other other different spots. But the the other part to that was. Um, we had Janine Crossan on the show uh, last last week, I think, and so she's the um, uh, founder of uh, Power by um, Flossie, and she was basically saying that she feels we're going to go into a fear based economy for mm. the next for and she's in hydrine, so you know she'll have the software back end for uh, hairstylists and, and hairdressers and all that other shit, and 
she was saying, yeah, we're about to go into a fear-based economy. And she was saying from, and the interactions of all the business models will change for, you know, Yelp reviews around around hygiene will become all of a sudden different, especially whether you, know, you don't want strangers touching your face and massages and hair and nails and all these other things. Um, it's going to change all that shit up. So she was basically wow, saying, yeah. to your point is, there's going to be a fear-based economy. And then if you're going to want to interact with them, there's going to be a whole new level of expectations that, that you'd be wanting from others too mm. that's so yeah that's actually very insightful i hadn't thought of that at all but yeah i mean i i can totally see that people will now use that as their number one criteria about deciding <laughs> about deciding who they interact with right yeah it's going to change i think it will change it's going to ch- depends how long it goes for right like i think new zealand will if if we're on track to doing the same things we do and we keep it can close we'll go back to some type of new normality with you know um cultural bonds very soon some other parts if it goes for too long and it either builds resentment or distrust or fear or, or it, it, it's going to be interesting to see the actual feeling of the state of the nation and the, for all the different countries around the world right because you put time and it changes habits and then you put currency on top of it with with community i think fundamentally it could it could change societies globally based on their culture right Absolutely. I think it, it already is, right? Like I think they were saying that in um, Wuhan when they sort of opened back up after the lockdown, there was still, you know, a lot of fear from people about, you know, going and just doing all the stuff they would have done in the past. So even though they opened back up, you know, shopping malls and restaurants and things like that, people didn't really want to go to them because they were yeah. e- they were just still afraid. And also they... I think you become like, you sort of, you know, you get desensitized to the stresses of every day. Like I think about my old life now where I was just, you know, on planes all the time, traveling, like, do, you know, in a hotel, like every night, like going to different client sites. And then that's really stressful, but you kind of just get used to it. And now I've been sitting in my house for five weeks and I'm like, oh, wow, can I actually go back to doing that? It seems like a lot harder than it would have if I didn't have this break from it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think it will, I mean, you know, when you're you're used to a certain way of then living, you want to like, will I, I mean, I'm just thinking about myself, like, would I jump on as many planes as I have in the past? I'm like, probably not. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. And, and, And until there is a, until there is a vaccine, which everyone has and it's free and it's done and the government pays for it globally for everyone, you're probably not going to feel that way, you know? I mean, the the good thing about the, the energy and momentum of New Zealand is it's enclosed and it's safe and we're ve- it's become very clear that we are physically safer at the moment than in America. You don't know who's coming into what counties. You don't know what's sort of bubbling away or what's going on. Hmm. Do you think um, one of the things around vaccinations that I've kind of wondered about, you know, as a scientist, one of the most frustrating things is obviously this sort of anti-science, anti-vaccine movement, which has, you know, particularly in the United States, really taken off over the last couple of years. And I think seeing the way the world is when we have a, you know, widespread, highly infectious pathogen that we don't have even like, it's just an example where we don't have a vaccine for it and how much people want a vaccine for it. Do you think Mm -hmm. that it will change, you know, the general public's perception of the importance of science and the importance of vaccines particularly? Totally. I reckon what I'm hoping is science gets a PR kick in the ass and they become the new heroes, right? Because if you even think about the public sentiment to social posts around nurses and doctors and firemen and policemen and women and and all the different um, crew, and even if you look at a lot of the um, ads that have come out for different supermarkets and stuff, praising the everyday heroes of of those that are stocking the shelves and helping at the yeah. reception and doing all these things, like the the I, I feel that not only will they be respected more and and given props more i genuinely feel that the the tone and energy of who the heroes from this are actually gonna be those that for a long time haven't had the love that they that they really deserve you know like in new zealand we've got a big one around teachers and nurses we're like yeah 
teachers and nurses should be paid flipping way more than what they're getting paid. You know, my, my wife's <laughs> a, my wife's a nurse and, and she's a nurse at um, Starship Children's Emergency. You know, oh, wow. they're not start, they're not starting off on on, cr- on crazy bank. And so I really feel that this will probably be a moment to to make heroes out of those that 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 truly deserve it. And so once again, I, I feel that will be quite cool to see come out of it. So. Would, that would be would very. That would be very cool to see. I think the um, the anti um, sort of scientific, you know, rhetoric that exists is is challenging. Like as a scientist, I think you know you go into it because you're you're very genuine and you're wanting to solve these problems. And um, I think particularly for industry scientists, so people who work in the biotech industry or the pharmaceutical industry, like there, that's one of the areas where you know, the number of times I interact with just everyday, you know, people in the general public, like say, you know, my Uber driver or whoever, and they're sort of anti, they ask me what I do. And I talk about, you know, my company and, and that we work with, you know, pharmaceutical and biotech companies to help them get their research and development done. And like, they just hate biotech and pharma. And I say, you know, every single drug that works was produced by a biotech or pharmaceutical company. Like they, nothing came out of any other mechanism every single one of those drugs that works was developed by those companies and for this for this disease every vaccine and every drug that works will come out of the industry so it's like i just really hope people stop being so kind of i think naive in the sense that these are industries that are absolutely essential and particularly when you see that the devastating impact of not having therapies and vaccines um can have on the world are all the pharma companies all rushing for a cure and someone's going to make a trillion dollars is that's what's happening no. commercially right now what's <laughs> happening? no that's actually the really interesting part of it actually to start with you know it was the not surprisingly it was the biotech companies like the small companies that really had really innovative new technologies that straight away um started to be you know the leaders in terms of okay we need to come up with you know, a vaccine or a therapeutic. So some interesting approaches like Moderna, they have the first um, basically like messenger RNA vaccine. And so they were, they were kind of the first into clinical trial for their vaccine. Um, so that's a relatively small, you know, biotech company. And then um, in terms of therapeutics, there's repurposed therapeutics. So uh, Regeneron and some of the other big companies had drugs that were already being used to treat things like cytokine storms or other um, overreactions of the immune system. And so they were able to test those very quickly in patients and see if they worked. So those were those things like the IL-6 inhibitors. And then in terms of new therapies, so there's a couple of different approaches people are taking, but the most common is to develop, you know, antibodies that will be neutralizing. So be able to, like we talked about with the, um, convalesce serum where you take somebody who's already got antibodies you can also make those antibodies so make an antibody that blocks um the infectivity of the virus so again those are you know pretty small companies that have really interesting technologies like distributed bio and they're um they're sort of doing that initial using their new technology to develop um these therapeutics in partnership with the big companies who have really the manufacturing and distribution um, so I think that Adaptive Biotech's partnered with Amgen. Um, I'm not sure who Moderna's partnered with, but J&J also has a vaccine effort. So some of the big companies are, and they're definitely trying to kind of help and they're, they're shoring up their manufacturing so that they can you know, help manufacture this at scale when there is a therapeutic or vaccine available. But in terms of like trying to make money off it, if you look at Gilead, they have, you know, the the drug that's you know basically in late stage clinical development repurposed from Ebola to being tested um, in SARS-CoV-2, and that is an example where they've said you know they'll give away that drug. Um, so that's cool. So I don't think that they're trying to kind of take advantage of the situation. I think they're just like everybody else, desperate to yeah. to see the economy come back online. And for for those companies, actually, um, you know people you know, may not sort of think about this, but, you know, in terms of the rest of the hospital system, the rest of the healthcare system, besides COVID-19 patients, it's more or less shut down. So like people aren't going to the doctor for 
what they would normally go for. And they aren't going to the hospital unless they absolutely have to or unless they're a COVID-19 patient because they're afraid. Mm. So actually all of the sales of other medications and um, people like going to the doctor for other indications is, is really collapsed. Like those are, that's the thing I don't think people have talked a lot about, but certainly has impacted a lot of hospitals and clinics. How, how do you think this plays out in the next 12 months in the world? <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely don't have a, uh, you know, sort of perfect idea. And I think about it a lot, but I think, you know, like we talked about, it's probably going to just be this. Things will open up. We'll test like whether we can, what really is the drivers of infection. So is it that you mostly just get infected if you're in close proximity to somebody who has an active infection and you know, you're know you closely associated with them for more than an hour or whatever, like we just don't know that yet. So um, once we know that, then you'll know what things you can't do, right? So maybe you can't go on a public transport, like a, a crowded train, but you can commute to your office via a car um, so long as you're sitting within six feet away from somebody, you're fine, whatever, like all of these things, people have to start to actually, you know, figure out. And then it will be this process of slowly opening back up. And then there'll be, you know, resurgences in certain places, and then they'll have to get more strict for a while. And then, you know, eventually over time, we'll get to a point where there's either herd immunity or a vaccine, and then the virus will die out. <laughs> Man, it's gonna be it's gonna be a crazy crazy well um i really appreciate the time being able to talk through all the stuff and kind of simplifying it down there's obviously a lot of more you know scientific complexities to the different um options and data and all the rest of it but um thanks for dumbing it down for me and my <laughs> I, did, I didn't that was um, great <laughs> to chat with you no i really well, stay safe stay good and you um, too don't drink too much of that wine behind you it looks like you've got a good <laughs> step rolling Look, i'm jealous already <laughs> well it was great to meet you Stay safe. I'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye. See ya. Bye. Elizabeth Irons, CEO, uh, Science. Um, so, man, what a what a world. Just even seeing how she's um, seen it all potentially play out from her. I think there's definitely you can clearly tell there's a difference between um, you know the vibe in New Zealand of society and and the vibe in um, in America. Hmm. Travel. Be lucky you're in New Zealand. Shop team. I'll see you soon in the next one.